Will you uh, pray with me this morning? Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to reflect on your word and reflect on the church as we think about these, uh, this book, uh, the book of Revelation. Uh, help us open our eyes and open our ears to hear the message that we each need today from your word. In Christ's name we pray, amen. What makes a good church? What makes a good church? My guess is that for all the people in this room, for all watching online, we all have different answers to that question. I remember growing up, I was in high school and attended a church with my mother. It was a church that, I will not say the denomination, but it just featured a cappella singing. And I remember going to this church, and um, I, what I remember was I had to wear certain clothes to be there. Uh, I felt uncomfortable. And I remember the music was beautiful, but there were no instruments. I also remember the preacher who would wear a three-piece suit every week, give an altar call at the end. And I always remember him coming and no one ever coming down forward for the altar call. When I was in college, my later years of college, I was in another church, and uh, this church had instruments. Uh, it had uh, good music, good preaching, but what made that church special um, was the people. It was a group of people that um, Kate and myself really connected with. They loved, we loved each other, and we still keep in contact with some of those people all these years. But there was also a church down the street that was a little different because it actually had much better music. I mean, it was rocking. It was really good. The preaching was better, but um, for all that experience, um, when I went, I, I didn't feel, I felt like just a number. I didn't feel like I knew anybody. And uh, I never ended up getting connected there. As a pastor, I've learned that people define good churches differently. Uh, if you have five kids, it's probably a good idea that you have a nursery that's working. And probably <laughs> there's no asbestos involved. Uh, you probably want to uh, have a good children's ministry, a youth ministry, or mission, because church is not just about showing up, it's about making a difference. So you think of all those things, and we all have different definitions. What makes a good church? My question to you, and to, as we'll look at today, according to God, from God's perspective, what makes a good church? Because his definition is different than what way we would define it. So we're continuing the study as we're going through the book of Revelation, a 30,000-foot view we're trying in these seven weeks not to get bogged down in every detail about what's going on with every passage, but to give you kind of a synopsis and something that will be helpful for you in your life. I shared this last week, this picture. This uh, book was written to seven churches. It was a circular letter. You see a picture here. It was sent to different places, and it went around and went from one church to the next. So it would read, be read publicly, and it would go to one church to the next. And today we're going to look at these two uh, chapters of Scripture where it's actually about these seven churches. These are letters written by Jesus to each of these churches. And so today, uh, don't worry, there's no seven-point sermon. Uh, but I am going to talk about a good church, a bad church, and an ugly church. And I'll talk about how do we apply this to our world today. And as always, you can access the sermon notes if you'd like. Uh, we're going to be looking at Revelation chapter 1. So if you want to turn your Bibles there, easy to find. It's the very last book in your Bible. Revelation chapter 1. I'm going to read this. This is actually Jesus uh, communicating to John what uh, this vision. So he says here in verse 19, Therefore write what you have seen, what is now and what will uh, take place later. The mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the, uh, the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So what does that mean? Uh, there's, as I told you last week, there's a lot of imagery, and I don't want you to get bogged up in the imagery. Simply, some people have interpreted this about this word angel. What is an angel? Some have thought there is a guardian angel over every church. And that's the way they've interpreted this. But that word for angel can also be translated as messenger. So it's a common thing in the Jewish synagogue how many of the, the churches were formed. 
that there was sort of like in our day and age, the way we think about in, in the 21st century, is there was a lay leader of prayer. And the lay leader of prayer would pray on behalf of the church to the Lord. So many commentators see what is actually happening in these next two chapters as sort of the Lord answering back to their prayers, back to those messengers, okay? So that's sort of a little bit about what's going on. And the lampstand is simply, you remember Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And this will come up in a little bit later in the passage, uh, one of the, of the chapters of the books. Uh, but it's simply the idea that we are called to be the light of the world. Now, every uh, of these seven letters have a certain form, and this is the form. They sort of list the characteristics of, of Jesus. Some have a commendation of the things that they're doing well. Some don't have a commendation. There's some sort of complaint in some cases. Sometimes there isn't a complaint. There's a call to repent. There's a promise of blessing if you follow God's way. And then there's... Uh, a kind of a call to discernment. Whoever has ears, let him hear. And then there's a promise that is tied to the unique situation of this church. So I want to talk to you about the first church, the good church. There's actually two of them. The one was in Philadelphia, but the one I'm going to talk about is the church of Smyrna. The church of Smyrna. This, ironically, is only the only city of the seven that has survived to this day. And this is actually a picture of it. It's a kind of an artist's rendering of what the city would have looked like. It was a seaport city considered the port of Asia. It was destroyed and rebuilt, as you can imagine, on the water several times. And they had two major problems in this, in this uh, community of faith in this uh, location. The first was this. The Jews who were there did not like to be called Christians. The Jews wanted to make it very explicit to the Roman authorities, this Jewish sect, which is called Christianity, is totally different than what we are as Jewish people. So if you have a problem with them, it's not us, it's them. Okay, so that's the first problem. The second problem is, as I talked about last week, there was a, this thing called emperor worship. So it's simply the idea of the emperor or the Caesar believed that he was divine, and so he would, you would pray to this. And there was, in that community, a sense of loyalty to the, the nation of Rome. So if you were a Christian in this environment, you were on the lowest totem pole in the city. So I want you to hear that because they're going to experience uh, persecution. They're going to experience physical persecution, but they're also going to experience economic persecution. Imagine if you were in the boating industry there and you were a Christian. And the Roman government or other people, you would do business with people who are loyal to the, you believe the same things. So if you were a Christian in the boating industry, you would be the lowest on the totem pole. Imagine if you're trying to feed your family and you're not sure how you're going to be able to accomplish that. So with that, I want you to hear what the words here in, uh, in Revelation chapter 2 that Dustin read in verse 9. Jesus says to this church, I know of your afflictions and your poverty. In other words, I know you suffered, and I know how you suffered physically and economically, yet you are rich. And I know about the slander of those who say they are Jews and are not, but of the synagogue of Satan. Don't be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for ten days. Be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. So this church, in spite of everything, remained faithful. And they were suffered economically and physically. They uh, communicated good teaching in there. And also you sort of get the idea that they were faithful in their witness because if they were not witnessing about who Jesus was, they would not experience persecution. So this is a church that is commended by Jesus. You are faithful. This redefines the way we think about success. For many, success uh, in church is all about how many people show up or how many buildings you have. But according to Jesus, the faithfulness is most important. And he tries to communicate this at the end. He says in verse 11, whoever has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The one who is victorious will not be hurt at all by the second death. It's an admonition. Keep going. 
This persecution will last 10 days. In other words, it's going to be a short amount of time. Be faithful to the end. Don't give up. That's the good church. Say the good church. All right. Now let's look at the bad church. Now say the bad church. I did not practice that. That is just coming from my heart. Uh, Two churches that were bad, Sardis and one called Laodicea. You'll find this in Revelation chapter 3. But let me tell you about Laodicea and that, that community. This was a major town off of a major road. Very prosperous, had a stadium, had an economic uh, industry there, judicial seat. They minted their own coins. They had a garment industry that specialized in black cloths. They even had a medical school there that specialized in providing eye ointment so that people who had eye problems, it was notorious, be like, you know, uh, it might be like going to Vanderbilt if you're going to get your something done because they're like a, a research institution. It was sort of that, that type of reputation. They were also very self-sufficient because about 30 to 35 years before, when this, before this was written, um, there was an earthquake which flattened their city and in, um, they had an opportunity for a bailout from the government. And they said, we don't gonna, we're not going to take the bailout. We're going to rebuild ourselves. So this is this type of community. But they had one problem. It was water supply. Water supply. So there wasn't water right there, so they had to pipe it in. So there was this uh, hot springs called Heriopolis that was six miles away. Fortunately, it would, could be, uh, go downhill. So there was like hot, think about it, like hot springs, North Carolina. So these hot water, and they built this aqueduct so it would come to the city six miles but there was a problem. In the six miles, the hot turned to lukewarm. And on top of that, it kind of smelled. And archaeologists said that the, really the only thing that water was good for was bathing and for if you need to get your bowels moving. You should drink this water because that is great. So uh, in case you need to know that, you learned something in church today. But they also had another aqueduct from another uh, area that had cold water, and they piped it in through this, and they had the same problem. The cold water got lukewarm from the sun. So no matter what it was, they were lukewarm. So this takes this meaning that Jesus speaks in verse 15 of chapter 3. He says, I know your deeds. Now, a lot of times Jesus starts with a commendation. Here, he just goes right to the heart of it. I know your deeds, you neither hot nor cold. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. This would have been a word picture that they would have understood because they had spit water out of your mouth, out of their mouths. That you are essentially um, indistinguishable. There's no value to you. It goes on in verse 17. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. In other words, they think they're self-sufficient. Everything's going great. But the true condition is you don't realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. Look at those words and think about how that would apply to a, 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 a prosperous community, one that's in the garment industry and one that specializes in eye ointment. This was... This would have been hurtful to them. I counsel you to buy gold refined in the fire so you can become rich. And white clothes to wear. In other words, you need to leave behind the black clothes that you're wearing to this white clothes of holiness. So you can cover your shameful nakedness and solve to put on your eyes so that you can see. In other words, you think you can heal yourself. You got it all together. But Jesus is saying, you don't have it all together. Instead, you need healing from me. And then he says in verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. The bad church was indistinguishable from the world. There's no difference. They hadn't picked a, picked a side. They're just sort of, what are you? And Jesus had words to say about that. So the good church was faithful. The bad church was indistinguishable. The ugly church was isolated. The ugly church was isolated. And you see actually three different churches uh, of the seven 
And the one I'm going to focus on is the city of Ephesus. Here is actually a picture of the city of Ephesus. During Paul's time, this was uh, an economically thriving city. This was the largest one. In fact, Paul spent two years of his ministry in this location. There was major buildings. There was a theater here, which is a picture. Go back to the picture. If you, uh, this theater, if you go back, yeah, 25,000 people could fit in there. Think of Thompson Bowling. All right, just to give you uh, an, an idea. And then this next picture is the Temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They even had a bath complex that had uh, hot water, cold water, uh, a swimming pool, exercise equipment, and oil, uh, an oil place that you could get a massage. So this is a place that had it together. Now, Paul, during his time there, it says, if you read in Acts 19, he actually preached there for two years. The first three months, he preached in the synagogue, and, uh, and then he preached every day in the lecture hall. So he focused on this because it was a thriving city. Now, uh, if you read in Acts 19, you'll hear this story about this, and some of you might remember this story. It's an incredible story. After he's there, near the end of his two years, he is there, and um, people are seeing his power and uh, how God used him to exercise demons. And there's a group of uh, demon exercisers who are going around, and they say, they see some demons in some people, and they say to the demons, in the name of Jesus Christ, whom Paul preaches come out. And uh, the demons have a response. It's never a good idea. When the demons respond, it's not going to go well for you. So the demons say, um, we know Jesus, we know Paul, but who are you? And the demons leap from this person who's demon-possessed to this whole group of people. And as a result of this, uh, they leave the city naked and embarrassed and beaten down. And it said here, throughout that whole city of Ephesus, the name of Jesus was, uh, was lifted up higher. And as a result, in that city, they took all their incantations and books that were worth several million dollars, and they brought it to the middle of the city, and they burned them. Could you imagine that? This would be a huge revival. And yet Paul had to leave as a result, uh, even though in that revival, business, in a sense, won out. But he had this to say, i got to move on, Jesus, Revelation chapter 2, uh, yeah, chapter 2, he says, I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. I know that you can't tolerate wicked people, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name, and have not grown weary. In other words, there's a lot of good things, but look at verse 4. Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. Now, you've, some of you who have been in the church a while know you've heard this verse. And this is sort of like, you know, when you first accepted Jesus, you had this excitement, and then it just waned over time. That may have been what's going on, but I think there's more going on if you look at verse 5. Because verse 5 says this, Consider how far you have fallen. Repent and do the things you did at first. What are the things they did at first? They were excited about their faith. They witnessed. The whole city had a, basically a revival because of an active power and also because of their communication about the gospel. So what does this mean? In other words, they need to go back to what they used to do because they're now more like a holy huddle. They're isolated. We're just kind of do our church stuff and they're going to kind of do their world stuff. And to Jesus, he's saying, y'all need to stop that. Because if you don't change, I'm going to take the lampstand out from among you. Which means you are no longer going to be a church if you don't share about, about me. Man, I could keep on going, but i got to move along. So, how does this apply to us? How does this apply to us? Let me tell you a story, and then I'll wrap this up. There was a story of a husband and wife who um, were in love. They loved each other, but they just simply grew apart. They went to a counselor, and uh, 
the counselor said, tell me about your problems, your relationship, and blah, blah, blah. They talk, and he said, well, when were you the happiest in your relationship? And said, well, we were most happy. We had a great honeymoon. And then in the first few months, we, we go out on dates. We still keep things up, and things just, we just kind of grown apart. And uh, the counselor said, well, here's your prescription. Number one, um, action precedes feeling. So what I would suggest you do is start going out on dates together. And number two, I want you to schedule a, uh, a second honeymoon. And they're like, we don't have the money for that. I said, well, it's going to cost a lot more to get divorced than going on the second honeymoon. So which one would you rather choose? So, so they booked that. And guess what happened over time? The feelings ended up coming back as they got to do these actions again. As you think about ourselves and about which church would we be, what would Jesus say to us at Central? What would he say to the American church? We would like to associate ourselves with the good church, wouldn't we? Interesting, five out of seven churches, Jesus' message is repent. Repent. Five out of seven churches. What do we need to repent of? Well, let me ask you this. In a church in America, how do people choose churches? They choose churches based on what their teaching is, what their music style is, what their building is. It's all consumer-driven, isn't it? What if those who call themselves Christians, instead of thinking, what can I get out of church, said, what can I bring? What can I bring? I read a story from, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, bald guy. Drawing a blank. I read a story this week. Oh, Francis Chan. That's who it was. Uh, his seven-year-old daughter had a birthday party, and uh, they all bought presents for her, and she was so excited to go to the birthday party because they're all bringing presents. What about if church was like that, that church isn't about a person on a stage or music, but it's all about Jesus? And it's about how can we bring him the gifts that we have? It's not about our own personal preferences. What about that? Or what about the statement that Jesus said, if you love one another, all people will know that you are my disciples. Would you say people are overwhelmed by the fact that we love one another? Is that the primary characteristic of the church? Man, they just love each other. This is different than being friendly. We're very friendly people. It's a whole different thing to love one another, that if you're going through a difficult time, I'm going to sacrifice for you. Or if you're going to celebrate, I'm going to cheer for you. Most of us don't understand that because we're not involved in those types of relationships enough. Where they, were, they really did that. They had that type of community. So what would, the, what would Jesus say to our church? What would Jesus say to you? Would he say that you're just sort of living an isolated faith? That you kind of do your church thing and then you live whatever way you want? Would he say, is your faith really indistinguishable? Are you any different than the world? Could anybody tell you're a Christian? Or would he say, you're doing a great job. Keep being faithful. Don't give up. I've got to end with this, and then I'll pray. Revelation 3.20, a lot of you have been, heard uh, evangelists use this passage. Here I am, Jesus said. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with that person and they with me. And many times they, this verse has been used to like, get the new people in and say yes to Jesus. But it isn't about that at all. What it's about is, for those who are Christians already, like, I got to live in a new relationship. And it says here that knocking is literally a continual knocking. So Jesus is continually knocking on each one of our hearts that we would repent and live in fellowship with him. And I don't know about you, but these passages should challenge you. They challenge my faith, and I think to myself, would I be faithful Ten days seems like a long time to be persecuted. Am I going to be faithful? Are you going to be faithful in your love for each other, in sacrificing for one another, in sharing your faith? Would anybody want what you have? This is the message to the church 
not just back then, but the church to us today. Let's pray. God, I, I just feel like I got so much more to say, and I, I, I can't do it. And uh, I just pray each one of us near has uh, things in our, in our hearts that this might have uh, spoken to. We thank you, God, that you're in the heart-changing business, and we can't control every church in the world. We can't control uh, uh, a lot of things, but what we can control is ourselves. And we can control our own repentance and our own need to change. And we pray, God, that you'll help us to discern and hear your voice to each one of us. Our desire is to be faithful, for you to receive the glory that you deserve. That there are literally millions of Christians right now worshiping you, this risen Savior, Jesus Christ. And so we pray, God, that you'll help us to be faithful in this time in which we live and in our church that we would be all the people that we need to be for our families, our neighbors, our, our workplaces, our friends. We pray this in Jesus' name.